いつかの小僧もいる倫子が庭いる勝たんところだおい伊豆島違うじゃないか水島あんなぼやっとした顔じゃないやっぱり人違いかなともかく歌ってみようか This is Criteria. Hey everyone, welcome back to Criteria. I'm Thomas Miris and I'm here with my friend James Majewski. That's me. Hello everyone. And uh, we're here to discuss yet another film from the Vatican film list. This one on the category of values, namely Kon Ichikawa's 1956 classic uh, World War II film, The Burmese Harp, originally called in Japanese, Biruma no Tategoto! Uh, you know, um, I I, uh, I came up with a joke. What? Uh, this was from years ago, watching like a Kira Kurosawa samurai films, uh-huh. and it, uh, it occurred to me quite early on that the same sort of sound could be used to mean like a really wide range of things Mm -hmm. if the subtitles are any indication. Right. So like, could be like, yes. Or like, could be like, like just shock. (laughs) Or like, could be like, you know, like getting ready to fight or something. Right. Like, like, oftentimes it's, it's an affirmation or agreement. Just like a, right. Yeah, but like, uh, but yeah, this this sound. I don't know, you know, if it's like a if it's like a feudal Japan thing, yeah, or, I don't know. or or some sort of militaristic thing. Yeah, but you know, interesting. Maybe I'll just sprinkle that throughout the episode. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I remember watching some. Uh, I used to watch a lot of like subtitled anime when I was a teenager, and I remember that there was a sound that people would make. It was like oos. Have you ever heard that one? No. It was like a, like a, in like a, you know. Or no, I mean, <gasps> <laughs> in in like a, uh, you know, some kind of team or uh, class or something. If they had like a sensei, you know, and they all like it was their way of saying like, uh, you know, um, what do the Marines say? Semper Fi. No, I mean, not no, really. I don't know. I mean, they. Yeah, it was almost like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah Sorry to any 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 marine listeners. 
I don't really know what Marines say. I was just a Marine listener. Oh, yeah, that's right. Welcome yeah. back, Thomas. <laughs> You're back from your nautical I listened, adventures. I listened to plenty of podcasts in my Marine Yeah, so for those uh, who don't know, Thomas was away for about a month on a cruise gig playing as a musician. Yes, I was playing on a cruise ship in mostly South America, Mexico, went through the Panama Canal, et cetera, et cetera. It went very well. Uh, it was a really good gig. The band was good. Everybody got along. I saw some cool places. Went saw the bones of St. Peter Claver down in Colombia. Uh, and you didn't even plan on that. You no, just... I did not. <laughs> I saw the bone. I saw the tomb of another St. Peter also in Guatemala. Say they call him like St. Brother Peter. I don't know much about him. And I swam with the dolphins, which was very odd. Man, if there was a way that we could get this up on the YouTube for for our what, me swimming with the dolphins. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, maybe I'll put a throw a picture in there. <laughs> Why not? Um, but uh, yeah, no, it was really nice. And I managed to do at least some podcast editing, not much else, mm -hmm. while I was away. Um, but uh, yeah, now I'm back. This is our first one recording for, you know. And are you still feeling like the waves? Well, yeah, I had this weird condition. It's not that common. Sometimes it'll happen for like a few hours or something after you get off a ship, if you've been on for a while. But I have something where I the, the whole world still feels like it's rocking. And I got off the ship a week oh, ago. Man. Um, I think it's starting to subside slightly, which is great. Thank God, because I was getting worried. It's not really supposed to when it happened. It's not supposed to last longer than a day or two. Wow. But I read online that there are people who have had this for years. Oh, my God. Which gosh. sounds horrible. Now, I don't feel nauseous. I just feel like disoriented and dizzy, like yeah. things are, like I'm sliding around, especially when I'm inside and when I'm sitting still. But anyway, I think it's getting better. Thankfully, it's called. It even has a name. It's called Mal de Debarkment syndrome, <laughs> uh, and it's not really after or, or like Mal de Debarkment syndrome. Oh, I guess. like yeah, you've, Debarkment. You've, yeah, you've disembarked. Malady. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Poorly. Yeah, exactly, exactly, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, it was very, yeah, very strange. I can feel it right now. I can actually feel the room tilting back and forth. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. So it's wild. very odd. Yeah. <laughs> Another cool thing that happened on this trip was we went to Vancouver and I met up with our frequent guest co-host, Nathan Douglas. That's who, if awesome. you're a regular listener to the podcast, you know, Nathan and I you have should become... throw a picture up on the video. I will. Of the two yeah. of you. Nathan and I have become very good friends over the past two years that we've been working on this podcast. He's been a valuable counselor and, and, uh, and guest and, um, so it was just a, a wonderful experience and a blessing to meet him in person. I love you, Nathan. Uh, and uh, it was great. It was just great. He he took me on a walking tour of Vancouver and uh, went to a great sushi place. We went to the – they have a great park there with like some natural forest and stuff. It was – yeah, really nice. That's awesome. Really nice experience. So um, – but yeah, so uh, – you're about to have a baby. No, no news there, really. No news from yet, last time. But probably the next time we record, or maybe not the next time we record, but certainly the time after that, mm -hmm. <laughs> there will be some news. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, the Burmese Harp, 1956. This is the second Japanese film we've discussed on the show. It's the second. It's the other, though, the second of two Japanese films on the Vatican film list. The other one we discussed was uh, Akira Kurosawa's Dersu Uzala, and this was really cool. I don't know if you had this experience, James, but I think uh, I really felt like I was experiencing something strange and different hmm. when watching this film from a different culture. Now, there's plenty of things that I could relate to. There's things I could understand. There were certain tropes in there. But um, most of the Japanese live action films I've watched have been samurai movies. Yeah. And this is not that. And... It it deals with Buddhism, it, you know, all these a mind a Japanese a distinctively Japanese mindset. Yeah. I felt, yeah. um, and so uh, it was a really great. I really enjoyed that aspect of it. That I felt I really felt like more so than when I watch plenty of other Japanese movies that I was entering into something. Well, right a off the different. bat, it's it's you know unique in that this is a World War II film but not from the perspective of the allies That's or right. the Americans, you know, in the yeah. Western front. And the only other one of those I've watched is Das Boot mm -hmm. from 1981, mm -hmm. uh, which is about a German U-boat crew. Yeah. Highly recommend that. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I feel that like, you know, so often when we see a World War II film, it's usually in the European theater and it's usually on the side of the allies. And then if yeah. not, you know, it's the, the, you know, US GIs in the Pacific yeah. here, uh, we begin with a Japanese battalion that's in full retreat. You know, this in is Burma. toward, toward yeah. the end of, of World War II. Um, in fact, we, we we come to find that it's just a few days after Japan has surrendered. Yeah. Uh, but at the beginning of this film, uh, the the group of soldiers that we're with doesn't yet know that. And it would be hard, by the way, of course, it would be harder to swallow this film if the film took place was about actual fighting yeah. between the Japanese yeah, and the yeah, allies, right, right. Right, right? It would be harder to swallow that from a Western uh, perspective, you yeah. know? Um, and even so, this film received some criticism mm-hmm. uh, for being, you know, um, for whitewashing and things like that, sure. uh, which we we'll get into. But but uh, the film, yeah, the film mostly takes place just after the war has ended. Mm-hmm. And it's about this battalion. Um, and they're somewhat unique. Uh, this company is somewhat unique in that they are... Uh, their their captain is musically trained. And so he, uh, just to keep their spirits up and give them something to do, he's basically trained them as a choir. And they have a particular uh, member, their scout, their lookout, is uh, a really good self-taught uh, player of the Burmese harp. Mizushima. Mizushima. That's the only character... Who really is given a name that's significant yeah. in this? In yeah, this, I'm sure other characters yeah. are named, but but he is our focus. Yeah, and he's he's the protagonist. He and the captain are the are the two protagonists, but he's really the central figure. And um, so this film basically traces his path, separating from his company on a mission, and then the psychological and spiritual effects that this mission has on him mm-hmm. um, and his journey alone, alone through the Burmese countryside, attempting to reunite with his company who have been taken to um, a prisoner, taken of to camp. a prison of yeah. war camp. Uh, th- th- I guess I, I looked this up. The Burmese uh, campaign was basically the Japanese and some like Thai army versus the basically like the British, there's like a British, Australian, and like Indian force mm. in Burma that mm. they they were fighting against. Interesting. Um, so before we get into this mission, um, well, I think it's worth I think it's worth noting that, um, you know, in my experience, a lot of war movies, at least war movies set from in World War One and World War Two. They always have a significant scene with music, with singing, with like communal hmm. singing. Have hmm. you ever noticed that? No, I have not. Okay. So, for example, Paths of Glory. Yeah. Uh, which we watched last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, a, there's a very important scene at the end with music. Yeah. Bridge Over the River Kwai comes to mind. It does? Okay. I haven't yeah, seen it. Yeah, like the... Uh... Okay. Okay. You haven't seen it? No, no I haven't okay. seen it. Yeah, well, it's like um, an iconic... And... Uh, Let's see, Grand Illusion, which is on the Vatican film list we discussed on this podcast. There's an important scene where they're all singing together. Yeah. Das Boot, have you seen that? Yeah. Das Boot has a scene. It's not as important, mm-hmm. but it is a one of the most memorable scenes for me because the German um, Navy uh, people on the boat, on the U-boat, are singing – an English folk song. Mm-hmm. It's a, they're singing. It's a long way to Tipperary, yeah. and it's a it's a notable scene because they're singing a song from the people that they're fighting. Yeah. And there's this like uh, Nazi uh, propaganda guy on board because these are all just regular soldiers, not like indoctrinated Nazis. We should watch that movie on this show. Yeah, yeah. I love that movie. Yeah. Um, this guy is is getting uncomfortable that they're singing this English song, mm-hmm. and the, and the mm-hmm. captain goes, you know, don't worry, this is gonna this is not gonna interfere with your propaganda efforts. Um, and that this is like the it happens to be almost it's like the second most memorable scene of the film for me. So, um, yeah, and I could I could we could give more examples. So it's interesting that this film starts out with it begins with, uh, well, it begins with this this epigraph which is at the beginning and the end of the film you see this burmese landscape this and it says uh what it, what is it uh the soil of burma is red and so are its rocks yeah. something like that yeah. and then um 
we go to this company and we, we're immediately introduced to the fact that they sing together. Yeah. And uh, they end up in this village, uh, this Burmese village, and then they're surrounded by the British force. And they're trying to pretend like they don't know the British are surrounding them. So they're just singing and laughing and clapping yeah, and stuff. An incredible um, sequence. And it's interesting, though, because there's this song that they're singing that the, the British uh, start singing as well. And they sing along together. And it's this weird moment of peace, sort of like, you know, the famous World War One Christmas truce or something of that kind. And then they're given the news that Japan has surrendered and they, they surrender. So... This this film is based on a children's novel by a guy named Takeyama, which came out in 1946. It was a very popular book, also among adults in Japan. And um, Takeyama was inspired by realizing that this Japanese song, Hanyu no Yado, was, uh, which was known to all Japanese people at the time, was actually a version of an English folk song known as Home Sweet Home. And so this... This big, this first big moment in this film is the uh, the Japanese and the Westerners singing this song together, yeah. and uh, accompanied by Mizushima's harp playing. Now, for me, it was like I felt like I had seen scenes like this before in movies, so I was like, okay, because because usually they're 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 climactic scenes or something, but this yeah. is right at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. So what I found interesting right off the bat is that this movie. Uh, focuses in on the, the the music as a consistent part of the movie. It's not just one emotional scene or something. Uh, it, w one of the things that distinguishes this company is that they are a musical yeah. company. Yeah. So it's just interesting that what's, what's often a heightened moment in another war film uh, is just sort of like the ground on which this film builds because yeah. music is used in all sorts of different ways for, for communication um, and I, and I'll talk more about that later, but, but one of the basic functions is that, uh, Mizushima as the lookout plays different things on his harp, depending on whether it's, you know, there's danger or it's the all clear. Right. It's kind of interesting because music, uh, serves this purpose of communication right off the bat between people who are separated in the, in the first instance, it's Mizushima playing his harp to signal, mm -hmm. right? He's over there, they're over here. The next instance, they're using music to communicate with the Burmese natives who have been nice to them, although it turns out to be a trap. Um, and then they're singing as uh, to disguise that they they know they're surrounded by the British. Right. And then that quickly turns into... And my favorite into... part of that is when they go to dance out to their munitions cart because they yes. realize they've left their munitions cart out and like just one shot will blow it up. Right. And so they like they do this sort of procession with like dancing and like branches. It's pretty funny. It's amazing. I mean, you've never seen anything like it in a war film. Yeah, you know, it is fun. Um, but but then, yes, then there's another use of music in this sort of response from the British that diffuses the situation and creates an opening for them to let them know that Japan has surrendered. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So those are that's that's how music starts and that's, off. And that's yeah. just in the first like fifteen minutes of the film. Right, right. You know? But then it's it continues as a through line through the rest of it. Yeah, because because one of the big aspects of this film, or the central aspect of this film really, is uh Mizushima being cut off and set apart from the rest of his company. Yeah. And so Music ends up being the only way that they can really communicate, with the exception of a letter that he writes to the That's captain at the end of the point. film. That's an he does not, point. in fact, he does not speak to them at all later. Later in the film, yeah. Even though they, yeah, right from the beginning, you yeah. know, when I was watching it, and I still didn't quite know what this film was going to be about or where this was going to take me. Um, you know, I found myself thinking about the presence of artists in the world you know he's already set apart from the beginning they the the narrator who's uh um one of the members of this company sort of telling this story in in retrospect he says that mizushima was never trained but that he just had a knack for it and he right. quickly mastered this harp and and so you already have this sense of him being set apart of him having unique gifts and of him having a unique 
role to play, a unique kind of vocation within this group. Um, and so right from the beginning, I was thinking about artists. I was thinking about artists in war. I was thinking about artists in, in you know, any sort of uh, non-artistic enterprise. Um, but then the film takes you to other places because uh, he's set apart a second time as being you sort of the elected uh, prisoner to go and speak to another battalion of Japanese soldiers that's still holding out in the mountains. Right. Now, I, I'm no like historian, but I did uh, uh, spend a little bit of time listening to a, a history podcast once about Japan in World War II. And I was surprised to learn that this was actually a very common uh, yeah. phenomenon of, of Japanese soldiers refusing to surrender. Um, and, and in some cases staying for years and years. And yeah, yeah. I think there was one guy who like even like held out for like a couple decades or something yeah. uh, in the woods. You're talking about the hardcore history yeah. episode. Yeah, I've, I haven't listened to the whole thing. I've listened to a little bit. Yeah, but but he, he mentions uh, one guy in particular who kind of just like terrorized this this village for, <laughs> right. for, for years and years, maybe even decades. Um basically as like this sort of lone wolf right. uh commando uh refusing to surrender for him the war was still going on and uh that that podcast um uh hardcore history i forget the name of the Dan Carlin yeah he he points to like a whole series of factors um that contribute to to this attitude but but one of them certainly is this this sense of honor you know that traces back to the samurai, yeah. Um, and this, this that that surrender is really just out of the question. Anyway, um, Mizushima is sent to go speak to these guys and try to get them to lay down their weapons. Um, and and then we begin to see just how different Mizushima is in other ways as well, sort of in more moral or even spiritual ways. Right. Um, yeah, if not quite spiritual, then definitely there's a moral difference between him and this this group of uh, Japanese soldiers that is refusing to surrender. Um, uh, he goes and uh, pleads with them, but of course they refuse. They won't submit to that humiliation. Um, but he's no pushover himself. You know, they accuse him of being a coward, but he he mounts a pretty full throated defense of why this is actually, in fact, the selfless thing to yeah. do. Go back to your country, yeah. live, work for your country, help rebuild. Um, so you really get a sense of his integrity, of his selflessness, of his courage. Um, and uh, and so this is a whole other aspect to his character that's being built upon sort of like you know these additional layers yeah and it's interesting because i think that in the film as the film progresses he becomes like that ironically he becomes that holdout not well, that fighter yeah. hiding in the mountains but he's that guy who won't go home when everybody else does that's right it's it's it's, it's, it's not a, over for it's him. a total like uh kind of parallel yeah mm -hmm. yeah i thought about that um how the table is switched where at the beginning of the film, he's pleading with these soldiers to leave this this entrenchment um, and to surrender, come back to Japan, and they won't. Later, of course, his battalion, his company, is pleading with him to come back to Japan, and he won't. And yeah. uh, and that is from a uh, a kind of uh, spiritual awakening that he has after. Uh, this group of soldiers that he he's unsuccessful at uh, at getting to surrender after they're all wiped out, and uh, and he's he's taken for dead as well because he's caught in the crossfire. Um, yeah. He he dons the disguise of a Buddhist monk. Um, yeah, he steals the, the the clothing of a monk who nurses him back to yeah, health. Yeah, yeah, basically as a way to uh, you know kind of uh, be anonymous and travel freely and try to reunite with his his, yeah. his company. But um, but in the course of this, uh, you know, both from experiencing the piety of of uh, the local Burmese who he encounters, um, uh, as well as this sort of experiencing this 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 decisive moment at the tomb of an unknown japanese soldier yeah um he he 
sort of uh, is onlooker to what is a Christian burial service right that's being granted to this this dead japanese soldier that they don't know it 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 does it changes something inside of him and yeah. he ends up deciding to commit himself to the life of a a buddhist monk right yeah yeah so yeah um it's interesting the way that this film functions as a japanese kind of anti-war film or or a less than jingoistic Japanese film. Um, you know, we've all heard about the fanaticism of the Japanese yeah. troops, the Japanese people, and refusing to surrender for so long. It's often invoked as a justification for the, you know, the the war crime of of nu- nuclear bombing right. Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Um, but uh, it's interesting to note that. Even at the time of the war, there were Japanese people who were not so crazy about it. Yeah, <laughs> to, to understand it, um, I recently watched a really great like two-hour interview with Kurosawa, mm. and he said that at the time he uh, was hoping Japan would lose the war. Yeah, he was relieved when Japan lost the war because he um, knew that if Japan won, then this fanatical military yeah you know government would just have complete control over japan right. um and so he was glad and that was just interesting to hear that from the perspective of a japanese person who was around at the time yeah i, I remember watching a, a documentary about toshiro mifune and i think that he he had felt similarly he had actually been a soldier on if i'm not mistaken yeah um yeah, and and you know the Japanese government has never officially apologized for war crimes committed hmm. um, during World War II. It said that it regrets its invasion of other countries, but it's never officially apologized in the way that, say, Germany. Yeah. Well, I you think know, has. You, you get you get a nod to that in this film when they are when when Mizushima's battalion is immediately sold out by the Bur- the local Burmese who have sort of taken them in. Oh, interesting. Um, you yeah. know, because J- Japan invaded Burma. And so, uh, uh, I like, I don't know any, any details, but based on what I do know, I'm sure there was, there was some. Sure. Yeah. You know, so this, this movie doesn't show those war crimes. It does show that fanaticism in yeah. the case of this Japanese battalion. It doesn't show war crimes. Um, some people have accused this movie of whitewashing because, um, the pity of, uh, we see piles of Japanese corpses, soldiers' yeah. corpses in this film. And that's part of the, the trauma that sets Mizushima apart from his company and puts him on this mission mm-hmm. is seeing all these, these piles of corpses on his way back to reunite yeah. with them. It's worth noting that that's when this film gets the most dark. It's yeah. not really a dark film as no. World War II films often are, yeah. but but it's it's in those moments of yeah. seeing the corpses. Although Ichikawa made a film three years later called uh, Fires on the Plane, which is apparently far more grisly and horrible. Oh, there's really? Like it's like a uh, Japanese a company stranded in the Philippines. Yeah. There's like cannibalism. Well, and just and as like, like an aside, I almost this is the first World War II film I think we're covering on the podcast. And there's, there's a bunch of them. There's several. Yeah. I kind of almost wish that this was the the last because I don't. Yeah. I don't. I'm not as optimistic about the other films. Well, being it's interesting. It, uh, it's interesting. It's uplifting. an it's an interesting way to start yeah is from this japanese perspective yeah. but what i was going to say is that some people accused this film of whitewashing because it doesn't show these war crimes you know his sympathy he's really focused on burying his japanese brothers in arms yeah that's pretty much the focus i mean there's certainly a wider connection to humanity that he has but that's that's his focus yeah and so even as he is separated from his company and chooses not to go to japan for the back to japan for the time being it's still his uh, there is still a natural uh, national piety as well as yeah. a human piety uh, at work. But anyway, I, I read this essay by this critic, um, Tony Raines, and he, he said that probably that the author of the novel writing in 1946 would not have known about these war crimes. And that even in 1956, when this movie came out, it's very possible that, um, uh, uh, Ichikawa would not have known about them either. Right. Um, so that may be a factor in this as well. But again, we do see that fanaticism 
at work at the very least and it's certainly an anti-war film yeah. even if our even if our pity and, is more focused on the japanese soldiers yeah but i think there's also a commentary that ichikawa is providing in setting up these sort of dual these mirroring scenarios where you see at the beginning of the film these japanese soldiers unwilling to lay down their arms and then at the end of the film mizushima unwilling to 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 go back to japan uh and and leave this what is essentially his you know his vocation to uh uh being a buddhist monk yeah. a buddhist priest he's going to become yeah um it's it's there i think that there is a commentary in that um <clears throat> and uh if it's if it's not super heavy handed it's still there that there's like it's a false hum it's a false not a false humility it's a false pride you know it's a, it's like a um there's a there's a self-centeredness that masquerades as honor honor right and that's that's i think you see that in those soldiers because they're all kind of they're acting really like manic and they're they're looking at each other and they're kind of taking their cues from their their commander you know um in fact i think that this from what i understand this kind of, of of an attitude had a lot to do with the uh, the the general like militarism of the Japanese government at this time, right? You know, um, and so it, it's like the 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 power of 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 human respect, yeah. you know, and of and of hierarchy, um, yeah, and. Uh, there's a collectivism that is, in this case, not for the sake of the common good, you know. Yeah, um, and, right. And it's often noted it's, that that Asian cultures are more collect collective, right? You know, but it's precisely uh, that that Mizushima has to sort of, sort of, you know, charitably, gently but definitely. Um, come up against with his yeah. company you know? well it's also interesting that Mizushima's company we don't see them fight uh yeah. we see the other guys at least firing a machine gun mm -hmm. fruitlessly into the distance but yeah. um we see them sing so you know as hippy dippy as this sounds like that's the difference ultimately between them is that one is the collective in service of something destructive mm -hmm. which it calls honorable and the other is the collective that is doing something constructive. Yeah, you know, but even and a that, and a and a, const and a co collective that is doing something that is constructive among itself is also a collective that's able to reach out and communicate with others. Yeah, and even but even that collective, Mizushima has to recognize he has that he has to let that go. You know, right? But it's so, not because they're doing something bad. Right. His is the case of someone being set apart mm -hmm. for a special calling. Yeah, yeah. And so there's a difference between rejecting the collective. He never rejects them. He doesn't no. even reject Japan. You know, it's that he is being true to his faithful to his calling. Yeah. Whereas he is, I suppose he doesn't reject the other soldiers either. It's more that they reject mm -hmm. they reject him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, in fact, he's faithful to his belonging with them even after their death in this right. quest which ultimately becomes his quest only like fully made explicit at the end of the film although certainly indicated before then that he's going to stay in burma until he buries every single japanese yeah. corpse yeah. that he finds and i think that that's the opening uh tableau that we see at the beginning and at the end of the film that's is, right is there's plots, you realize it's like graves, a grave site yeah, yeah you know yeah so it's interesting you know he he goes um uh, he goes. He he he's nursed back to health by this monk. He steals the guy's clothes. It goes off. He experiences these these Burmese peasants just being very deferential to him, bowing to him, giving him food. Um, and then he has this horrible experience of seeing these you know carrion eaten uh, Japanese corpses, and he buries a bunch of them. He does something noble right off the bat he buries a bunch of them but he leaves many of them yeah um and so ultimately it's after he reaches this prison camp um and sees this 
these British hospital workers burying, I think it was the, maybe the, was it the one other Japanese soldier who survived from that company mm -hmm, on Triangle mm -hmm, Mountain? Mm -hmm. uh, they're burying and they're singing a, they're singing a hymn and there's a, clearly a minister there. Um, and that brings back to mind all these corpses he's seen. And that's what triggers his quest ultimately. Yeah. And his realization that he cannot reunite with yeah, his well, company. Man, I thought that it was cool that, that, the decisive moment was was witnessing a christian service well that's what's so that's one of the things that's very interesting to me about this film is that okay i i'm certain that this natural piety that he, that he has and his desire to pay respect to the dead i'm certain that that existed in buddhist culture without direct christian influence already you know that i'm sure that was already there right I mean, that goes back to there's that's a universal thing. That's in right. Greek. That's in Antigone, you know, right. but it's interesting that in this film, the filmmaker chooses to have it be um, not not his instinct to bury the dead, because, as I said, he's already done a little of that. But that that inst that that calling for a complete giving of oneself to this task is triggered by witnessing this Christian yeah. ceremony for a Japanese soldier. So it's right. these British they've been fighting. And for an unknown Japanese soldier. That's right. You know? Yeah, so that's that's very interesting. And also there's something interesting with the music too because they are singing some Japanese songs, but there is a, quite a bit of Western influence on the music that they're playing. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. mean, what he's playing on the harp is certainly not what a Burmese native would right, have been playing right, on the harp. Right. I mean, he's playing Western harmonies, and many of their songs have Western harmonies. In this song, uh, it's not just a song that happens to be shared by Japan and the West. It is a song that comes from England. Yeah. So there was obviously a certain amount of Western influence on Japan already before mm -hmm. the Second World War. Um so I don't, you know, it's just interesting to me that they could have easily had it be just all Japanese folk songs, you know, with no Western influence. Right. But they chose to have the music be Western influence. They chose to have this music when we first see our first glimpses of dead bodies are the freshly dead bodies of this company after having been bombarded yeah. by the British. And the music that we hear is a Bach. Mm. piece mm. you do you remember yeah yeah and it's that it's, we sing it as the hymn oh sacred head surrounded yeah 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 um it's this bach piece and um uh so it's just interesting that this christian ceremony is what pricks his conscience and inspires him but also we have a little bit of that influence on the music as well when the mm -hmm. filmmaker could just as well, and, and he becomes a Buddhist priest, so he doesn't become a Christian, but, you know, Ichikawa, or the guy who wrote this novel, could have just as well had it be a purely Buddhist yeah. thing, yeah. because culturally it would be certainly plausible, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. He could have seen a Buddhist monk paying respect to the dead, right, right. you know? Yeah. Uh, so it's just interesting to me that he chose that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think that there's... And I guess that's one way of also providing an anti-war message. You right, know? right. Well, I think that there's, from the beginning of the film, there's like a, a like an attempt at a kind of reconciliation, you know, um, that I think that this is a film that wants to see, you know, humanity as, as a big family, of course, without annihilating the differences of, of nationality of, of a people being a people. I think I, there's a, there's a quote, I think, uh, from, uh, Luigi Gisani, uh, the founder of communion and liberation. Uh, it's, it's a quote that I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, but it was something like, like a people that sings is a people like that is, like aware of itself or like, like is, is, uh, I think you might've cited that in another episode. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I just remember that and maybe being, in our chari chariots of fire. Yeah. Discussion. I, it's just a, a very memorable quote to me because it's kind of rung true to my experience that like that a community that sings is a, is a community that's like aware of itself as a people. Right. And, and there's like a sense of belonging that comes from, from singing. Yeah. And, and that when you can share music and share song, you know, um, that's like a whole other level of of togetherness, 
you know? And, and so I think that he's driving at that from the very beginning of the film, but that all of these overlapping, um, all this overlapping, like uh, all these overlapping communities, the Christians, the British, the Japanese, the Burmese, you know, he's taken under the mentorship of a Burmese Buddhist priest, you know, yeah. and he's going to remain in Burma. Um, it's, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, there's this line, Burma is the Buddha's country. Yeah. Right. Right. This priest says. Right. So there's this healthy sort of cross pollination that comes from interaction with other peoples, you know? Yeah. Um, it's it's interesting to me that it is his piety towards his dead brothers that ironically cuts him off towards from his company. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's 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 what cuts him off from his own country even though it's in service of his country right. in a way. Well, I I think that the precipitating uh mission, the precipitating uh desire is to bury the the dead of the 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 Japanese war dead but i don't think it's ultimately reducible to that right you know that like in this he's he's discovering a whole different mode of relating to the world mm -hmm. and to his family and to his country and uh you know and and to strangers right um so so even though we don't spend a whole lot of time going into the details of that i think it's implied that there's like really a Full, a revolution that's occurring inside of him, yeah. you know, and a new identity that's being brought forward. Yeah, um, and we see that too in the fact that he initially puts on puts on this monk's garb, which he steals mm -hmm. from a monk. Yeah, right. And so, right, you know, we see this. Um, I'm sure it's a desperate act, but we see this ultimate. Um, I guess you could use the word conversion in an analogical sense. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, can I take this moment to just like sing the praise of this this actor who played Mizushima? Yeah, I, I thought that the performance was incredible um, because we see him sort of under so, like sort of under so many different aspects and striking so many different attitudes. Uh, so at the beginning, he's playful and funny. He's cracking jokes, you know, even about like the Burmese people, right? Um, uh, but then. You know he's also uh, he's passioned and and uh, courageous. You know when when the guys that he goes to try to convince surrender uh, don't he he in a last ditch effort just tries to go up and with a with a white flag and and sort yeah. of affect this surrender, force it. You know, but that's like putting himself at tremendous risk, both from being fired upon by the British. And by being killed by his own yeah. uh, men, you know, and uh, and then later when he's 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 undergoing this spiritual transformation, it's totally believable, and and there's this gentleness to him um, that that is just very compelling, you yeah. know, um, and and just just very very nice touch. You know, I think that it would have been so easy for for him to come off as like really cold and unfeeling and stoic. Yeah. As many of the other Buddhist priests that we encounter in the film yeah. do. And and I think that this is a pretty common uh way for a uh a, a Buddhist priest to, to to come across. But but it it wouldn't really do for this film. And and so it doesn't. You know, with with him, there's there's a a a softness and a delicacy to it. Yeah, that's also uh, fleshed out by the times where we see him sort of behind the scenes, kind of like in Man of God, where we see some of some of his his interior struggles uh -huh. and his sadness. Um, but uh, but even elsewhere, you know, like in the way that he interacts with the the little boy, the beggar boy. Uh, who he teaches to play the harp um or uh you know in the the way that he uh you know interacts with with the bird on his shoulder or whatever you know there's there's a there's a softness to it yeah. that's really quite nice it is interesting the way that the burmese people are portrayed in this film the only characters who really speak 
are the little boy and this lady, this mm-hmm. old lady who speaks Japanese and she trades goods with the imprisoned Japanese yeah. company and brings information and messages and stuff. Um, and the rest of the people, including the other Burmese monk that we see, um, are very like silent impassive expressions we see them praying or just standing and watching yeah i guess we do see them watching and watching the company singing and enjoying that and in some case one case singing with them but for the most part there's this silence and this like sort of impassive expression which sort of becomes uh mizushima's way as well Mm. i mean I don't know that we see him speak a. Do we ever see him speak a single word after he starts his mission to bury the dead? Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't I'm not know. sure that we ever see him wow. say anything after he has. I think the last conversation that he has is with the boy who asked him to play the harp. Wow. Uh, before he sees the burial service yeah, and runs striking. out. Um, yeah. So we hear a letter that he's written. We hear his communique via parrot. Yeah. Um, but we don't actually see him speak anything else. We see him play the harp. We see him stare at them. Yeah. There's these very – some of the most striking shots in the film are of him in – well, you know what? I think he does speak when they're – he's inside the like Buddha cave and they're trying to communicate with him. I think he does sort of speak to them to himself okay you know i think yeah. he like says their names yeah right, uh, right. and like see right. some of his interior anguish there right but anyway um uh what was i gonna say he um there's these very striking shots of like when they meet him on the bridge which is right after he's decided to yeah. leave yeah or, or not to go back to japan and we see it twice in the film from his from their perspective and his from his perspective and he just doesn't identify himself he doesn't they walk right past him and they're like is that him yeah and he doesn't say anything and he sort of turns to the side and walks away yeah and that's one of the most striking shots yeah you know in the film well, especially because the first time it happens we don't even know that that's him right you know and then the scene at the end when they're playing music to him and they realize it's definitely him it's like the day that they're going to leave and he's just standing on the other side of the fence watching them and ultimately yeah. takes the harp and starts playing yeah but even then he doesn't speak and right. his expression is very right. like right right his expression, his features are silent as well as his. Right. You yeah. Know. There's, there's. I think like, they were they regard they refer to it as like a blank stare. Yeah. Well, there's like a mercy <laughs> that that he shows them in playing the harp with them, but that's really as much as he's able to give them because he he, he has changed and his life is different now. Yeah. You know, and he has to let them go, and they have to let him go too. And it's not just that he's he's a monk; it's also this like inability to communicate what he's experienced. That's right. That's right. That that um, words won't be able to do it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, oh, man. Yeah, I thought that this was this was a very cool cross almost between, you know, like like a priest film and a samurai movie. Uh, what was samurai like at that? Well, his you? being this like lone this lone figure, you know, yeah. um, I think that that's, that's what, what made the samurai movies so influential on American directors was like the lone samurai in like, you know, this, this, this the Ronin. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you know, the, in, in a world that no longer, that he can no longer really inhabit, you know, right. because the samurai class has fallen and, and, and so he's just kind of yeah going through it on his own and of course, that's also what like a like a noir detective is. Sure, you know? sure. Uh, but um, but but that's that's kind of the the position that he's in. Um, that he's he's not in Japan, but he's also uh, he's not in a war anymore. He's not a soldier anymore. You know, it's like this place isn't this world isn't for him, and so. Uh, even that last shot of him walking off into the distance, you know, uh, in his in his monk's robes, uh, just to me felt very, uh, you know, reminiscent of of a shot in a Kurosawa film or something like mm-hmm. that, you know. Uh, but but it also has all of this all of this spiritual drama that I associate with uh, a film like you know Diary of a Country Priest or uh, right. you know. It, you know, any of the other priest films that like we've considered on this podcast or, um, 
it's uh it 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 was like firing on both of those levels for me which was which was fun you know yeah. it was like a really it's a really enjoyable film right. um you know, I, I like all of the movies that we watch on this podcast, but I don't necessarily enjoy all of them, or I certainly enjoy some more than others. And this one was was a real pleasure to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, uh, but the music was certainly not a small part of that. You know, like the yeah. sequences sequences with music are really nice because they're not just. Um, these like throwaway moments, but they're actually things that we linger on. Yeah. And, and the music is quite nice. Um, the, uh, I, 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 I listened to a interview with the director and he talked about how, when they recorded the choral segments, they had a mix of not just, you know, like choir members, but also, you know, regular people and tone then he, deaf people yeah, yeah some some tone deaf people too and uh and of course all of it sounds really great but when i went back and listened to it i feel like you really do get that sense there's like a sort of like uh there's a, a well-roundedness to it uh-huh. a colloquial sense right. you know um that's really nice yeah yeah one thing i liked about this movie is that like i, I was saying the foreignness of it like i like I, i'm sure that there's things that i'm missing in terms of like Buddhist symbolism and stuff, you know, right? But like, I like that in a way, and sure. also the film itself plays on this exoticism in a sense with like its shots of this strange Burmese landscape and the the strange temple architecture and stuff, which is mm. which is foreign even to the Japanese, you know, right? That's a um, good point. So that's that's kind of an interesting an interesting aspect of it. it does portray the Burmese people as being definitely a different culture. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And one other thing that we didn't touch on is the relationship between Mizushima and this captain. That there's like a real hmm. love. Yeah, we really really haven't talked about the captain. Right, right. There's a real tenderness between the two of them. And like in a, 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 you can see it in the way that the. Uh, the captain is excited to see Mizushima and is also, you know, unwilling to believe that he's he's dead. Right. Um, but then also the how willing he is to accept this decision that Mizushima has right. made, you know. Um, yeah, because he starts out, you know, when they've been captured, he makes this very moving speech about how they're all going to go. They're going to share this suffering and yeah. defeat together and they're going to go back. They're right. all going to die in Burma together or they're all going to go to Japan together and not one person will be left behind right you know and that frames the stakes right you know yeah and so he spends the rest of this film trying to find out what happened to mizushima trying to communicate with him when he believes that this is this monk um and uh yeah it's uh and then it is beautiful as you said the way that he accepts this decision and he yeah. comes to understand him even yeah. before he writes him this beautiful right. letter the, the moment that he points to the captain is uh he's gone into this room where the ashes of the british soldiers are being held um and there is a box that mizushima has included and he's wrapped it in the japanese style and that's like a tip off to the captain right. and Opening it up, he sees this Burmese ruby, yeah. which Mizushima had dug up uh, on one occasion when he was burying uh, the dead along this shoreline. Um, and, you know, that he, he, he later points to that as being the moment when he, he, he understood. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that it's just such, a, such an evocative uh, way of, of, of dramatizing this moment. Because it's like somehow Mizushima is dead to the world now, you know, but he's chosen the better part. There's like this pearl of great price. You know, mm. of course, I'm looking at it as a Christian right. um, and I'm thinking about it in Christian terms, yeah. which I don't know is is what is how it's meant to operate. But like for me, that was like, yeah, very, very evocative. Yeah. Um, and and I think that you know this 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 larger theme of of respect for the dead praying for the dead um 
of the duties that we have that the living have toward the dead uh is one that is yes universal but is also like particularly i think important for us as christians yeah. you know because what happens time and time again when christians show up in these pagan uh societies is there's often like a real um revolution of how you treat your dead hmm. you know and um and one of the things you don't do is is cremate them you know right. um uh but uh but um you know i i i think that it's something that like we could stand to to reattend to now because like you know without taking this off topic i just think that you know you see it so often nowadays where where in social media or in the news like there's a real like uh contempt for the dead sometimes you know um someone dies and immediately people are piling on criticisms and getting their digs in and and then like stories are coming out about this person what they did you know uh to this person and you know and it's like uh like there's a real uh a real sense that like we've lost a a a due gravity and reverence around this mm -hmm. you know this 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 final threshold that we'll all have to cross right the the ending is quite interesting because after these read this letter uh from mizushima explaining his motives as they're on the the boat going back to japan we get this sudden return of the narrator yeah. and it turns out we we find out that it's this insignificant member of the company right we didn't even know who he was and he talks about how, you know, yeah, I never really paid too much attention to Mizushima before, but, you know, I, I was thinking on the way home, you know, uh, I wonder uh, how his family would feel as they read this letter. And, you know, I, I hoped that, that the captain would be able to explain it to them. That's kind yeah. of an interesting and surprising <laughs> yeah. way to end the film, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, like this idea of the lack of understanding. Yeah you know, yeah. of the wider Japanese culture. Right. And especially know, towards this family. choice. Yeah. 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 That is interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a vocation film, you know, I'd, I'd show this to a group of discerning young men, you know, thinking about the priesthood. Ah, huh, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's in the Vatican film list category of values. Right. And I think that it's, it's anti-war message and it's respect for the, the dead is probably what what gets it in there but right. i think that also you know the the notion of calling of being set apart of um you know uh living truthfully to that even as you know others don't understand and are pained even by your decision i think that that gets it on there but honestly i would have just as easily put this under the heading of art i thought that the way that not just the music was handled, but also just the way that this is shot. It's yeah. it's a beautiful film. Um, I felt that like the the beauty of the beauty of this film visually was very consonant with the beauty of it orally, mm -hmm. you know, um, or melodically. Uh, it's it's got a lot of really nice uh, examples of you know composition. You know, where where there's a really nice picture that the director has, has composed for us. You know, um, I think some of the more grisly examples are with the bodies, you know, where where you just get this like this still this image that that is almost like drilled into your brain mm -hmm. because it flashes back, you know, right. when when mm -hmm. uh when Mizushima is having this uh, this this crisis, but then other moments too, you know, when uh, there's a one really beautiful shot when uh, it's along that same uh, uh, riverbank where he discovers the the ruby, where Mizushima is sort of in the bottom left of the frame, digging a uh, yeah a, a grave, and then there's a, a group of local Burmese who are who are kind of watching him. Um, yeah. You know they've they've been fine to leave these bodies there for however long, but 
his example causes them to join, you know, and, and that, that drama plays out visually in the way that this is framed, you know, right. A lot of really wonderful instances of high contrast in the lighting, yeah. you know, of men, of people being obscured in the dark and stepping into the yeah. light. He uses a um, lot of that to, to convey the, like the brightness and the heat of Burma. Yeah. Um, right, right. Right. There's a lot of interesting use of shadow when they're in the, their camp hut. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also some really cool close-ups, like uh, like wide-angle close-ups of Mizushima, like when he's discovering these dead corpses and the way that we focus in on his reaction mm-hmm. and these sort of sudden close-ups when he's being like yeah. set back on his feet. You right, know? right, um, right. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it's uh, this is a good one. You know, Ichikawa remade this film in color. Oh. In 1985. Now, remade it or just like colorized? No, he remade it in 1985. With, with a different cast yeah. and crew? Oh, wow. Yep. I don't know why, <laughs> but he did. I would be interested to see it. Yeah. Um, it was not a hit like this film was. Hmm. Um, you know, he was 40, 41 when he made this film. It was his 27th feature. Wow. And he said it was the first film that he really felt he had to make. Wow. wow. <laughs> Which is interesting. He had just been doing what the studio assigned him. Even in this case, another uh, more experienced director uh, was supposed to be given the thing, but he couldn't do it for some reason. Huh. It was a studio assignment to adapt this novel. Wow. Um, but this was his like this was his first really significant film. Wow. 27 films. It's just a different era. It just goes to show you it's a different era. era. Yeah. Whether in Hollywood or in Japan at the time, the right. studio, the studio era. Right. You know, it was just studios assigning the director to make a film. Who knows how many they would have made a year. Right. You know. Right. Um, so I yeah. thought that was interesting. Yeah, that is. That is. Well, yeah, I mean, this made me excited to watch more Japanese films. As I said, so many of the live action Japanese films I've made have been samurai movies. So it kind of makes me want to watch some more non-samurai films sure. from Japan, like, sure. uh, you know, Tokyo Story or whatever, mm-hmm, things that mm-hmm. I haven't seen. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's also getting us ready to see more World War II films on this list. Yeah. Uh, is it? Know. <laughs> James yeah. wants to do them all uh, like at once. <laughs> I'm not so sure that I want to do that, but uh, yeah, yeah, we'd have to vary it up with our off film, off list choices to keep the mood. Yeah, well, lighter. I, I I think that you know it's nice that we watched Father Stew not too long ago because uh, there's some similarities here, you know, in terms of mm-hmm. uh, of, a, of a man finding his vocation, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, um, we really enjoyed that, and our our uh, please do watch these films. By the way, if you listen to the show, watch the films. You can find so many of them on the Criterion Channel. That's where we watch this. It's one. the only streaming channel worth anything. I I think. Yeah, it's it's really quite valuable. Um. So uh, next time we do know what we're doing. Next time, uh, we are going off the Vatican film list once again. We're having a new guest on the show, Trevor Cribben Merrill, a wonderful novelist that I have interviewed on my show, The Catholic Culture Podcast. Really a man of many interests, also a a critic and a film critic, as well as a novelist. And uh, we'll be discussing a film that he chose, although one that I expected we might discuss on this show at some point. Uh, The Coen Brothers film, Hail Caesar. Great. So that'll be a comedy. Well, and that's good because we we did that Preston Sturgis episode. Right. I think that'll give us some... Uh, there was a big influence on the Coen brothers. So. Yeah. All right. Uh, what's going on? We've got our... Do we still have our campaign? Oh, yeah, definitely. So um, the campaign is heading into its second half, and uh, we could really use all, the, campaign, all yeah. the help that we can get over at catholicculture.org. Um, we've got a $60,000 matching grant, which is the biggest matching grant we've had for our spring campaign. Mm. Um, it's the smaller of the two campaigns that we run during the year. We have this spring and fall campaign. Um, this is the smaller counterpart, but it's really no less significant um, or, or critical for us. The, the summer is a slow time for us in terms of donations. There's just inevitably a drop off in donations. And uh, this campaign really helps us to to get through those slow summer months. But 
Also, obviously, this year in particular, uh, we're kind of expecting donations to flag maybe even a bit more than they otherwise would. Why so, is that? Because it's an election? No, uh, I mean, just the economic uh, uh, turbulence that's uh-huh. that's occurring. Um, uh, our, our monthly pledges still haven't got back to up to what they were before the pandemic. Uh-huh. Um, so we're, we're increasingly relying on these campaigns to, to to get us through um so uh so yeah so we have this sixty thousand dollar grant that's on the line but it's sixty thousand dollars by june 5th or bust if we don't raise this money then we don't win that grant um so if you've if you've not yet contributed to uh this apostolate this is a great time to do so because whatever you give is going to count twice it's uh going to benefit us and also help us win this this matching grant so head over to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio, and then we'll know that you're you're donating specifically to to this, to this podcast network and to all of our efforts here producing the various podcast shows that we do. Alrighty. Thanks everybody for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please do subscribe to our channel. Please share with a friend if you have a friend who is a movie buff and a Catholic, or maybe even a movie buff and not a Catholic. Uh, please do share our podcast with them. Um, I'm really grateful for this Vatican film list when I watch a film like this, which, you know, a a film buff would have gotten to eventually, but, um, it's really nice that the Vatican sort of brought forth these treasures and, and chose these specific films. You know, it's not a thousand films. It's not a hundred films. It's 45 films. They could have chosen plenty more, but they chose these 45 and, uh, many of the choices they made are very, you know, right on. So this would be one of them, I think. Amen. All right, everybody. God bless you. See you next time.